third, uh, this is the third uh, webinar we've had on Belarus already since the um, election on August 9th. The first two were more in a kind of public interest format, talking about uh, events and predicting what might come next. Very happy to do that as well, particularly in Q&A, uh, particularly because uh, the opposition has um, issued an ultimatum to Lukashenko to announce his resignation by the 25th, uh, by Sunday. Um, but today I thought uh, it was more appropriate to talk about um, some of the academic implications of all of these events, particularly, of course, because Belarus is a relatively uh, understudied country. Um, but I've included the best of uh, study in the English language uh, in the PowerPoint, um, which will be available uh, later. Claudia will circulate it. I don't want to jump straight into political science, however. Um, here's a couple of videos you might care to watch. One was made by the Belarus Free Theatre. It's quite, quite disturbing. Uh, Okrastina is one of the main detention centres where people were detained and savagely beaten. So it's um, uh, a series of interviews about people um, emerging from that trauma. And the second one is a kind of homemade English language uh, video uploaded by a Belarusian guy trying to explain things from a local perspective. Because a lot of this is about morality or the power of morality in politics. So we can't use that as a bridge to political science. Moral outrage um, solves the collective action problem in many cases. That's why so many people are on the streets and have been there for uh, over 60 days now. But I thought I'd start with that and also um, cease uh, me, <laughs> uh, has been in contact with the Belarus Free Theatre. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, they are trying to expand their activities um, and become a little bit more political. So they're looking for partners to do that. Uh, and if we go ahead, there'll be an announcement of a kind of new platform that they want to set up in cooperation with UCL probably in about November, December, um, to kind of provide a platform for voices from the country. Um, another prelude before I actually start, um, there's a short blog uh, that I put up on the UCL Europe site, uh, kind of summarizing some of the main themes that I'll be talking about today. Well, you may think that there's not been much previous history of protests in Belarus and therefore not much literature on it. Uh, but that's not true. Um, we can go back to 2006, the kind of era of so-called coloured revolution. Uh, activists tried to um, set one up in Belarus, two years after the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, uh, after a previous uh, controversial election, um, the model didn't work in Belarus, largely because the authorities got their blow in first. But um, Belarus was in many ways used as a testing ground for what Russians were already calling counter-revolutionary technology. How do you stop coloured revolutions? You set up um, counter-demonstrations, uh, you rig opinion polls, exit polls um, to match your... Uh, fraud, rather than allowing the discrepancy between the um, exit polls and the actual fraudulent result to spark protest. Um, and that's my first academic citation. Stephen Hall did his PhD at CIS, uh, and that's a pretty good uh, case study of uh, why that would be colour revolution failed. Uh, uh, Second wave of protests was after elections in 2010, 
they're always fixed. Um, so there's always some attempt at protest. Um, this was almost postmodern. People uh, knew that, that there were laws against mass protest. Um, so first of all, they tried silent protests on the street in small groups and then clapping in small groups. Um, this kind of ironic approach didn't really have the effect that was desired, but it began the kind of protests of um, informal society knitting together. I mean, one paradox of Lukashenko's repression of uh, formal NGO civil society has been to kind of drive um, coordination networks underground and they're more horizontal. So in 2011 and 2017, and even more so this year in 2020, you see a lot of informal uh, practices developing to support protest, um, crowdfunding uh, uh, being one such. But the most important prelude to all this was the so-called parasite, parasite tax protests in 2017. Uh, I didn't put inverted commas around that because that was actually the term used by the regime, uh, a rather strange attempt to tax the economically inactive led to protests amongst Lukashenko's supposedly normal support base, uh, the poor the people in small towns, the elderly. And people began to talk about two Belaruses, uh, the poor, the state sector, um, the regions, uh, and the kind of other Belarus that was developing alongside that, uh, the kind of new private economy, the IT sector, the new middle class. And basically both of those elements have been behind the protests uh, this year. Um, there was a candidate for both sides, uh, Sikhanovskaya, who is married to Sikhanovsky, uh, represented the, the uh, old Belarus, the neglected part of the country. Uh, and two other candidates, Babariko and Sepkalo, the new economy. Um, so a kind of double, double feed into uh, higher numbers protesting this time. So, so how does protest work? Um, it hasn't been like Ukraine. There haven't, hasn't been a, the occupation of public space. That would be the Maidan model. Both revolutions in Ukraine, the Orange Revolution, Revolution of Dignity, were based around the occupation of physical space, the square in the center of Kiev. Um, so you've had ritualized marches. Um, they've developed in character uh, by the kind of third week. There were women's marches on the Saturday as well as the general march. Um, on the Sunday. Uh, you've seen marches in different areas of Minsk. Uh, last weekend, there were marches towards the more working class areas to try and encourage people to um, strike against the regime. Um, there was even a march of babushki, uh, grandmothers against the Oman, the police. Um, so there's been some innovation, if you like, um, but only in sort of themes and direction. Uh, there hasn't been any attempt to challenge state power more directly. Uh, no storming of public buildings, no uh, pressure of public buildings. Um, not because of a lack of innovative thought necessarily, but of course, because the regime is um, more oppressive than uh, it was in the early stages of the Ukrainian protests. And recently you had a certain sense of frustration after uh, events in Kyrgyzstan. We won't go into the details there, but basically uh, another rigged election resulted in protest and overthrow of the government within uh, almost a day or two. Uh, so people did 
had actually begun to say, well, um, 60 plus days of peace, people's protest hadn't got us very far yet. Hence this people's ultimatum, um, which came out of a phone call between Sikhanovskaya, the opposition candidate and her husband, uh, who's still in detention. It was nice that she got to speak to him, but he said everything should be uh, tougher. Uh, one word, Zhostja. Um, and she, you can hear her actually talking to him and ultimately agreeing. Uh, but that's the amount of planning that went into all this, you know, one word. Um, um, but behind that is a sense that Sikhanovskaya uh, might lose uh, ground to more radical elements. Um, uh, that's why she made this um, tough call. But whether she can, uh, she has any resources or uh, ability to uh, pressure Lukashenko to give in uh, is extremely doubtful. So it's a bit of a hollow gesture, but was designed to prevent radical groups splitting away. There's plenty of other literature on um, uh, social media and mobilization. Uh, this article is about Russia. Uh, but there's plenty of evidence that um, social media, particularly tele this Telegram channel called Nexter, did play an extremely important role in mobilizing and maintaining protests. Uh, Nechter is the correct pronunciation. It means someone in the Belarusian language. So you're not a nobody, you're somebody, you have a voice. And again, there have been some innovative tactics um, partly because of the prominence of IT workers in A, the Belarusian economy and B, the, the protests. Um, so people have been using those skills in interesting ways. Um, these two groups, cyber partisans, cyber patriots, uh, have pursued a de-anon strategy, de-anonymizing the militia, uh, hacking into their names and addresses, contact details and putting it online. Everybody has friends and family. So the idea is to um, uh, disincentivize them from being uh, willing tools of the, of the elite. Um, and there've been attempts to coordinate thinking um, online. You can visit all these uh, sort of telegram channels where people have laid down the rules of protest. Um, that's interesting though, that the kind of six fronts against Lukashenko don't really go into much detail about how to get rid of him. So we see the kind of familiar academic uh, consensus almost that social media is great for starting protests. It's great for assembling numbers, um, but it's not particularly good for planning. Um, or developing the kind of repertoire of protest in real time. Other side of the coin, uh, this guy, uh, Vitaly Selitsky, died uh, unfortunately young. Uh, but he, he was a young Belarusian guy who studied in the West and actually went back to Belarus. Um, and he developed several important concepts. One was preemptive authoritarianism. The idea that the regime was actually quite good at forward thinking and front loading repression or preventing protest. Um, we've already uh, cited the example of uh, 2006. Um, there's some of his uh, works. And you can also see a, a brief discussion by me of why the regime didn't seem to be good at preempting this time. Uh, this overlaps with a, another concept, uh, the title of a book by Matthew Freer, Adaptive Authoritarianism, which came out last year. So he, he argued that um, 
Lukashenko's Secret of Survival, writing in 2019, uh, 25 years, uh, was to kind of vary the kind of palette um, to use elements of democratic legitimacy, uh, elements of performance legitimacy, i.e. Uh, delivering the goods, particularly econ economically, uh, maintaining patrimonial networks, particularly in the old state economy, um, allowing some degree of pluralism within the, within the elite, but still coercion where necessary. Uh, and he cited Solitsky's concept of preemptive authoritarianism. So the secret of Lukashenko's success was to be flexible. Uh, and, I, and our conclusion, I guess, now is that um, all these first four elements are in uh, severe decline. So the regime is left narrowly relying on coercion um, alone. Because previously, um, there was something of a social contract in Belarus. His three works that argue that, uh, including what actually called social contracts, um, again by Selitsky. There's an English version which you can find online. So um, elections might not tell us much because elections are fixed, but sociology might help. Lukashenko, when he first won a free and fair election in 1994, when he defeated a previous incumbent, Kevich. Um, so he was a kind of insurgent. Um, he won about 45% in the first round. So sociology tells us that his support base stayed relatively uh, stable thereafter. Some people argued that it went up a little, some people that it went down. Um, the argument that it went up was because he built a kind of new bureaucracy and plenty of people on the government payroll, kind of new electorate, as opposed to the old uh, Neo-Soviet base that had uh, voted for him originally back in 1994, uh, pensioners, state employees, people in the countryside. Uh, so sociology was possible, uh, and a lot of it was done by this group, ICEPS. Unfortunately, it was forced out of operation in 2016. Um, so we don't really have good data since then. Uh, and since the period since 2016 is the key period because the economy has been doing badly. In fact, since the, um, uh, over, over about a decade, um, but cumulatively uh, by 2017, economic difficulties were a key reason for the previous round of protests, the so-called parasite tax protests, and even more so now. So all the evidence is that um, if there is a single cause of all this, uh, it is economic. And it's the decline and decay of the social contract um, that is the main background cause of the events that we see today. There are some things though, which, uh, looking at retrospectively now, it looked like almost apolog uh, apologies for Lukashenko um, that take the argument of the social contract and uh, connecting with uh, various social groups uh, into the realm of almost apologizing for Lukashenko. Why didn't preemption work uh, in 2020? Well, there's a phrase that isn't an academic phrase because smart in smart authoritarianism doesn't really tell us very much. Um, uh, but the idea of flexible or adaptive authoritarianism or uh, uh, authoritarian states that rely more on uh, soft means of control like media rather than hard me means of control uh, traditional coercion. But smart authoritarians can make mistakes and they can even be dumb. Uh, 
uh, I mean, that's not a particularly academic answer, but um, Lukashenko clearly underestimated uh, the uh, potential of appeal of his, of his opponents in selection. Um, he excluded several candidates, but left in uh, a woman and is on record as saying uh, she was a woman and not strong enough, quote unquote, to do his job. So that kind of dismissive attitude was a clearly a strategic mistake. Um, but rather than that kind of a slightly uh, pop explanation, there are other structural factors behind uh, why uh, the challenges in this year's election proved to have uh, so much support and so much head, head of steam behind them. Uh, and as I say, that's because uh, initially Sikhanovsky and then Sikhanovskaya represented the left behind. Uh, Sikhanovsky's claim to fame was that he ran this vlog, uh, kind of online uh, YouTube uh, serial where he talked to ordinary Belarusians and acted as a mouthpiece for their grievances. And he was almost like the original Lukashenko, but with modern technology. Lukashenko was a kind of anti-establishment populist when he was first elected. So looking at a mirror modernized image um, uh, cannot have been comfortable and Sikhanovsky actually was the first one uh, excluded from the election. Uh, but then uh, conversely, you had two candidates who represented the new economy uh, on which uh, the economy as a whole is increasingly dependent for growth, um, for the tax base. Uh, the IT sector in, in particular, 7-8% of GDP already. Uh, and uh, incipient support for the latter uh, from within the governing elite. Selitsky came up with another concept, which was uh, what we now call authoritarian learning. That uh, Authoritarian states, particularly partner states like Russia and Belarus, might learn from each other, cooperate, uh, and uh, lend each other assistance. True. And that's why um, Lukashenko was able to survive previous protests, uh, particularly the ones in 206, 2010. Um, but arguably the concept of preemptive authoritarianism and the authoritarian international conflict if uh, you need to preempt a threat from your partner in the authoritarian international. So uh, since the war in Ukraine began in 2014, there have been more and more signs of Russia's dissatisfaction with President Lukashenko and uh, attempts to undermine him, even allegedly back uh, one or two or even three of the, th the candidates already mentioned in opposition to him this, in this year's election. Um, so it's difficult to preempt against your partner in the authoritarian international. Um, but Arguably, that has been restored um, now that Russia uh, has stepped in and agreed to help. Belarus uh, does not use much of what is locally known as political technology. Political parties, for example, aren't that important in a very personalized and patrimonial um, regime. Uh, you can look at the four main parties in Parliament. Uh, hopefully you can all see this table, it's hidden behind the pictures um, in my view. Um, parties traditionally weren't very important at all, only five out of 110 members of Parliament were members of parties in 2012, that's gone up a little 
1521. And the main parties look like the Kremlin parties in Russia. You have uh, a potential equivalent of United Russia, which is called Yelaya Rus, but it's not yet a formal political party because Lukashenko thought he didn't need it. You have Communist Party, you have a Liberal Democratic Party of Belarus, um, which is exactly like the Liberal Democratic Party of um, Russia. And the local equivalent of just Russia is called the Party of Labour and Social Justice. These are currently very small. Um, most of the people in the parliament elected last year are independents. But this is a potential future project, if you like. Um, but one strategy for Lukashenko might be to shift power from the presidency towards parliament, but towards a parliament dominated by newly animated versions of these local Belarusian version of the Kremlin, the four Kremlin parties. Um, political technology in presidential elections means two things. First of all, it means a kind of regular formula of one plus three. So if you look at the last election, that was literally the case. The one is Lukashenko himself. So what do I mean by three? Well, you have a standard formula of uh, this guy is, who is head of um, the Liberal Democratic Party of Belarus, like Zhirinovsky in Russia, Russia loud, populist, um, and his job is to uh, criticize the opposition loudly more than actually criticize the regime. Uh, in this case, uh, doubled up with another kind of pro-regime populist. But the interesting part of the equation is uh, the candidate that everybody talks about. Uh, it actually works for the regime to allow a uh, moderate opposition or an opposition candidate where nobody is sure if they're actually partly allowed by or encouraged by or connected to the regime, which in this case was uh, Tatiana Kovacavich. Useful because it blurs the very idea of the purity of opposition. People waste their time sort of debating whether this person is really independent or actually sponsored by the regime, um, blurring, as I say, the idea of actual opposition. Uh, this formula broke down in 2020. Um, Heidekevich had actually passed over leadership of his party to his son. Great, that these kind of thing can become a family business. Uh, but the son was uh, ordered to withdraw from the race because it looked like he was more likely to take votes away from Lukashenko's diminished electorate um, than from the opposition. And the candidates that were allowed into the election uh, as kind of moderate opposition were uh, completely outshone by the, su the surprise candidate, the woman, uh, Sikhanovskaya, and by the fact that she was able to campaign jointly with two other women who came from the uh, two other campaigns. And the feminization of, that, of the campaign was extremely important and interesting. You had a very low uh, entry uh, point because the agreed strategy was totally minimal. It, it wasn't really a political program. It was simply to have new elections, um, not these ones, but free and fair subsequent ones. Uh, and it was optimistic and it was warm uh, and it was patriotic. Um, and that totally out to the regime. 
Arguably, a little bit more manipulation and trickery might have helped Lukashenko. Um, and since the election on August the 9th, uh, you have seen Russian political technologists moving into Belarus to provide uh, belatedly much more of a uh, traditional Russian formula. So one is setting up counter demonstrations. Um, this is one. Uh, interestingly, there was there were none of these at all on August the 9th or August the 10th or August the 11th. Um, because the genuine sentiment of Belar Belarusians was not pro Lukashenko at all. Uh, so these kind of artificial demonstrations have been set up. Uh, and this rather crazy stuff, I love Batka, um, which means, uh, which is Lukashenko's nickname, which means strict Victorian dad, uh, Belarus, there's his official, um, there's the official uh, flag. So the idea that any ordinary young, young guy would actually voluntarily wear one of these is, is pretty ridiculous. Um, secondly, you get, uh, you've seen a mass takeover of uh, Belarusian TV by Russian journalists. This is one of them. And thirdly, you've seen the launch of new pro-Lukashenko, pro-Russia political parties. This one, if you can see, is called Soyuz. Soyuz is what it says on the uh, uh, banner there, which means union, union with, of Russia and uh, Russia. Well, there's not, nothing particularly- Andy, just to jump in, you I'm probably have a, a couple more minutes, so we also can squeeze in some questions. I'll speed up. If that's okay, great, thank yeah. you. Um, there's nothing particularly sophisticated in um, how um, uh, the ballot is fixed in uh, Belarus. Mainly it's through two techniques. One, early voting. Huge numbers are encouraged or forced to vote early when their vote can be more supervised. And uh, a completely non-transparent counting process with no paper trail where fraud is uh, ubiquitous. Interestingly, academically, you can uh, do things on the other foot. Um, you can use uh, sort of um, statistical t t techniques to prove the unlikeliness, unlikeliness of official results, or even expose where the fraud was done. Uh, skip over that. Uh, two final points. One other thing that has changed and that is a background to the events um, is an indirect consequences of the war in Ukraine in 2014. Lukashenko ironically decided that he needed more props uh, for his vulnerable regime and encouraged a process that was called soft Belarusianization, not, um, uh, not like the kind of Soviet Belarusianization in the 1920s or the kind of uh, state promoted uh, push for the Belarusian language in the 1990s before he came to power, but a kind of eclectic allowing of um, uh, a more synthetic approach to national history, not just a neo-Soviet one. And that has come to fruit. Here you see the, the red and white flag returning. Uh, you also see splits in, in the elite, caused partly by economic difficulty and partly by the rise of a new economy. Uh, you see problems with uh, well, a different foreign policy strategy, which I might give you two minutes on it because it's more interest to her, um, that from a kind of loyal uh, subservient partner, um, Belarus had, had switched to kind of hedging strategies um, to manage its relationship with Russia uh, and has made use of its diplomatic position at the center of the uh, Minsk process um, to promote these kind of strategies um, and to kind of diversify its rent treating strategies because Russia has been providing less and less money. Uh, you can see a long term decline in the kind of subsidies that Russia provides to the regime in terms of cheap 
gas. Um, so foreign policy strategies were also driving sort of cultural change and a limited political liberalization. Now we may be going in completely the other direction, back to Russia uh, and away from Belarusianization. Um, but partly at least that is behind uh, the uh, growth in support for a protest movement this time around. I'll stop there. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andy, for a fascinating and incredibly expansive presentation about the current developments, but also the context for Belarus. So we now have about 20 minutes or so uh, for Q&A. The way we will do this is I invite you to raise your hand um, and I will then sort of follow a list of um, hands that have risen and I will then invite you to unmute yourself in asking the question. If you would rather ask the questions in the chat you're also welcome to do that and just keep in mind that as I've already mentioned this meeting is being recorded. So does anybody have a question to Andy? Uh, yes, uh, Armand Grants, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you, what do you think about the whole uh, Maidan model? Like, how uh, crucial is it for Belarusian protest movement to succeed? Like, the fact that we, there is no Maidan uh, analogy in Belarus, is it like only uh, harming the opposition to the regime? Thank you. Uh, Andy? You yeah, answer? you might as well jump in. Well, the Maidan model means the occupation of public space as a kind of base for protest. Um, and it means central and symbolically important public space, i.e. not Balotnaya. Um, in the 2011-2012 protests in Russia, people weren't allowed to protest in Red Square or Manege or wherever they were sort of shifted. And that was an initial symbolic defeat um, into this uh, other area. Um, there are equivalent spaces in Belarus, um, but the main one, the main public square, uh, is actually on the cover of the book that Aglaya mentioned. Um, but it's surrounded by government offices. Uh, in Ukraine, the Maidan is down the hill from Parliament uh, and other equivalent government offices. Um, so you're much, much less likely to see the authorities agreeing <laughs> to anything like that um, because the, the physical distance is, is tiny. If you were in the square, you'd be literally outside the windows of government. Um, so can, can you do the same but differently, uh, possibly, um, you could occupy universities, you could occupy somewhere random, but where the physical defenses were good. Um, but that's a, that's a brave call uh, late in the day, you know, when you've got highly mobile and so far pretty vicious security services um, seemingly able to nip that in the bud. Uh, so people have opted for other strategies instead, passive resistance, uh, including striking. Um, real striking is, you know, might get you fired or beaten up. Um, whereas an Italian strike, lovely phrase, um, not going to work or going to work and doing nothing is um, arguably as effective and less likely to in, uh, induce repression. That's just me thinking out loud. I mean, if something happens, it may become the new paradigm that we haven't thought of. Um, 
but neither the kind of Maidan or the Balotnaya paradigm looks possible at the moment. Okay. Uh, do you think it's necessary for the movement to succeed or can the regime change be achieved without this paradigm? Well, what would you call where we are at the moment? Um, I guess stalemate is okay as a metaphor, um, but it's not, but it's because each side has very different strengths. Um, uh, the other possible strategy for the opposition is to undermine the strengths of the regime. And the de strategy, I think, is, is really interesting and actually quite clever. Um, uh, good use of technology, good uh, an appropriate identification of a potential weak spot of the regime. Uh, and that seems to have had some effect in discouraging some, some police uh, from engaging in violence, or at least thinking twice. Um, but um, unexpected events may also trigger change. Um, but, but of course, they're unexpected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there's a question from David Datton. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question, or I'm happy to read it from the chat. Um, so you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Here is it. My line's very poor. Can you? Yeah, let's try. And if not, I'll just read it out. Sorry. I, uh... Talk and type. Um, so... Shall I read it then? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Andrew. What precedents are there for an experienced authoritarian state backed by a regional power crumbling in the face of peaceful protests? <laughs> um, I think um, coercion power uh, is both a, a first order and a second order phenomenon, meaning that the amount of violence you use is important, but so is expectations, right? About how far, how far the state might be able or willing to go. Uh, so I think Yanukovych's problem, backed by Russia, um, in 2014 uh, was that he'd maxed out his repressive capacities. Uh, uh, and if he wanted to do more, he would have to physically invite Russia in, which in a more nationalist state like Ukraine uh, made protest even more virulent. Um, so literally police stations were being overrun in the west of Ukraine because all of the police were in, were in Kiev uh, and he couldn't rely on the army. Um, so Lukashenko's famous performative video which if some of you haven't seen, you certainly ought to have a look at, is anti Yanukovych. Yanukovych got in a helicopter, uh, put in money and art and fled, all right? So Lukashenko gets in a helicopter, he flies over the center of Minsk, he says rude things uh, which are broadcast on TV about the demonstrators and gets out in a flat jacket with a Kalashnikov, right? accompanied by his son in military uniform. So this isn't random signaling, it's saying I'm, I'm not Yanukovych. I'm not gonna run away. I will do whatever it takes. And Russia has, uh, I think, been strengthening that signaling. So Lukashenko, so, sorry, Putin promised to send um, uh, extra forces of coercion. He hasn't yet, but the promise is part of the intimidation strategy. You know, this regime is bad enough, backed by Russia, its coercive capacities are scarily high. Um, so that, I think, is the difference between this scenario and the Ukraine one. Because um, Russia was backing Yanukovych, um, but the frailty and the uh, reaching the limits of domestic coercion actually did matter there. Um, 
Whereas here, I don't think either the, the limits of the domestic coercion capacity or Russian assistance uh, have yet been reached. Um, so collapse um, because the regime is unable to coerce is extremely unlikely, uh, but collapse could come about from other causes. Thank you. We have sort of a follow-up question from Ian Tidder. Yeah, hello. Um, thanks, for the, yeah, <laughs> thanks for the presentation. Um, you mentioned that the deadline that the opposition set a couple of weeks ago is expiring on Sunday. And um, I yep. guess Lukashenko isn't likely to comply with that. So when that bluff is called, what do you think the reaction of the opposition will be after that? I mean, is there, it's also connected with I suppose whether the opposition can keep its momentum going as winter takes takes on now. They've been going for I don't know ten weeks or something, haven't they, since August? Uh, yeah, um, I mentioned this kind of phone con conversation between Sikhanovskaya and her husband because everything turned on this one word. You know, we've got to be tougher, right? Um, which isn't indicative of top strategic planning. Um, so in many ways, it was uh, a big mistake because the most likely outcome, yes, is indeed that uh, Sikhanovskaya can't back it up. Um, she's called for mass public strikes, but the first strike wave in August um, subsided when the government started firing people and putting strike leaders in prison. Um, so, mass strikes are pretty unlikely. Um, so she doesn't have much to back up the declaration other than another massive turnout, uh, which would help. Um, also, um, as a kind of technical point, the ultimatum was really badly worded. It demands uh, that Lukashenko declare uh, about departure. So he could say, oh yeah, I'll be off in, you know, five years after um, my illegitimate term is finished. You know, that would be a de declaration about de departure. Um, it, it doesn't demand resignation or that he immediately disappear, um, badly phrased. Um, but on the whole, I think it was made more to preserve the unity of protesters with some asking for more radical steps and therefore doesn't really make sense in terms of a uh, challenge to the regime that's backed by a real power. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have a next question from uh, Sarah Volgren. If you'd like to unmute yourself and if not, I'm happy to read it from the chat. Okay, the question was, what is the impact of the events in Kyrgyzstan on the current events in Belarus? Well, only the kind of debating point that I mentioned um, that you have seen some people say, um, uh, we've been doing this for two months um, and they succeeded in two days. Uh, but then in response, you said, you got a lot of people um, pointing out the very real differences that the protest in Kyrgyzstan was really one regional clan against another. Um, the president resigned, uh, isn't likely uh, in Belarus. Um, and this kind of thing has a history in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we should stop using the term revolution, I guess, because it's clearly something different going back to the tulip revolution in the noughties. Uh, you know, on at least three occasions, you've had clan-based uh, street violence overturning election results. Uh, and that's not really the scenario in Belarus at all. So people have pointed that out Belarus, within the Belarusian debate. Thank you very much. Um, there was a, so just to uh, let everyone know, so formally this event is set to finish at one o'clock. However, there are still quite a few questions. Two o'clock. 
sorry, two o'clock. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, until two o'clock. But um, assuming that Andy is happy to keep answering the questions, we may carry on uh, so long as the questions keep coming. And obviously, if you have to leave uh, and cannot stay for until the end, that's totally fine. And we're very happy that you have uh, joined us. So um, just to follow up, there is a question from Igor uh, uh, Kamenschik, and I'm apologies for mispronouncing people's names. Um, yeah, I'm very sorry. So Igor. Right. Um, so I have a question. Uh, unlike in Ukraine, where the main focus point was the intervention of the Russian government in Ukrainian politics, why is that not the case in Belarus? It's, to me, it seems like it's mostly an anti-establishment, anti-Lukashenko protest. And the second question is, uh, wouldn't you argue that it is within the Russian interest to uh, support a candidate other than Lukashenko in the sake of stability? Or are they afraid that if there's going to be a democratically elected leader, he will move closer towards the West. Thank you. Uh, well, throughout all of the phases um, of the uh, initial campaign, the registration campaign, then the actual campaign for the election, then the protests after the election, all candidates have been uh, very clear that this is as you say, uh, highly personal, it's anti-Lukashenko, uh, uh, and it's not about geopolitics, uh, and it's not about Russia. Um, and that has been universal um, and includes the Russian propagandist attempt uh, since they took over Belarusian state TV to frame it in those terms, to depict the opposition as tools of the West, um, Poland, um, USA, uh, to argue that the natural end result here will be a, a second Maidan, um, that it will, that the aim is to shift Belarus into NATO. Uh, I mean, that is very, very implausible. Um, and an obvious uh, retread of the Kremlin's sort of Ukraine narrative. And so may not have much effect, um, particularly because people are tuned out from state TV anyway, uh, getting alternative information or online. Uh, and because it simply doesn't marry to Belarusian reality. Um, so there is agreement that this isn't about geopolitics. Um, the only way that it could become such, uh, and that has stayed Russia's hand, I think, um, is overt Russian intervention, right? um, which might turn a, a pro-Russian country uh, anti-Russian. Although Ukraine has never, that's perhaps an inexact way of putting it, Ukraine since 2014 has never been anti-Russian. Um, if you uh, look at opinion polls, Ukrainians give the right answer. They blame the Russian state, but they haven't turned against the Russian language or stopped reading Tolstoy or anything like that. Um, uh, but a kind of, it would politically drive a wedge, obviously, between Russia and Belarus if, if Russia were to do that. So I think that is an important factor in staying Russia's hand, which leads to, bridges to the second part of the question. Yes, um, Russia has uh, toyed with the idea of getting rid of Lukashenko for some time, but you can see it doesn't really know what it wants. Initially, there was some talk, even in Russia, Russian media, of an Armenian scenario where Russia actually approved a transfer of power because uh, any successor was st still likely to be pro-Russian. Uh, to talk of managed succession, where the idea was that they would steer Lukashenko towards giving up power to someone like Babariko. And Babariko was mentioned, uh, according to media reports, um, in the discussion between Putin and Lukashenko in Sochi back in September. Um, 
But that was why Lukashenko self-inaugurated. Uh, the Russian ambassador wasn't invited. He was very, very clear that if there is to be a political process, it might not be transition at all, and it would certainly be on his terms rather than uh, Russia's, Russia's terms. Um, so Lukashenko, in many ways, is resisting a Russian steer towards some kind of dialogue or, or transition. Um, but someone like Babarico is temperamentally um, perfect. <laughs> he is a mixture of um, uh, he's a bit like Gamulka. All right. Gamulka uh, took, came back to power in Poland in 1956 because he suited everybody. He was loyal enough to Moscow, but he had a domestic power base. Uh, so Babarico is um, clearly uh, a pro-Russian potential oligarch, but he's also a patron of the Belarusian arts, etc. Um, and that would be kind of give him a base within a kind of medium position within Belarus and domestic political forces. But I think your question was really, if there is a free and fair election, wouldn't it produce a kind of different kind of result with a pro-Western candidate? Um, I don't think so, but we can't tell because elections have never been free and fair recently and the, the, the main opinion pollster is forced out of the country. So we do suffer from a dearth of evidence about um, what uh, the actually wants. Um, but I think if there is to be a succession, it is much more likely that it would be a highly managed one, a staged managed one towards the already agreed candidate, which would be someone like Babarika to keep the Russians happy um, rather than anybody more radical. Okay, thank you, Andy. We still have a couple of questions um, that we will hopefully go through. Um, there is Stephen a Hall, uh, so the student mentioned at the... Yes. Oh, <laughs> Former student. <laughs> thank um, you. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, my question is based partially on, on research that I'm currently doing in terms of how much is this the case 26 years into Lukashenko being in power, the ivory tower scenario, and also the tale of the two Natalias, Natalia Kachanova and Natalia Icewant, who have, it, it appears, been keeping a lot of information away from Lukashenko. Um, Icewant especially, his press secretary, seems to be the one that holds all the information and then gives what she thinks will help, will be beneficial to Lukashenko, gives him the information. So how much is this a case of, as I say, the ivory tower syndrome, that the regime has reached its almost nadir, it's fatigued, it can't continue? Uh, so ivory tower means out of touch here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you can see signs of that. Um, so in terms of authoritarian preemption, you know, clearly Lukashenko didn't read the runes particularly well. Uh, in terms of media strategy, you know, it looks it's slightly bizarre for a, an autocrat, a modern or a postmodern autocrat, to be caught out relying on digital propaganda um, and being sort of outflanked by uh, social media. But on the whole, that was the case that you had Lukashenko relying on state TV and it's very traditional and pretty boring propaganda um, and losing numbers and hearts and minds hugely to um, uh, alternative narratives on social media. Um, so his channel, the one managed by the woman whose name you just mentioned, Iceman, um, that's doubled its audience to, I think, 60,000, but Nechta is more than 2 million. Right? Um, and his sort of old fashioned attitude to women clearly caught him out. Um, and 
he changed the government before the election. The old government, which had been in power for two years, headed by Prime Minister Rumas, had an economic strategy to kind of um, promote as much private sector IT economy growth as possible and shrink the old safe state sector. Not particularly dramatic, but at least it had some perspective. So he got rid of those guys and replaced them with tough guy Siloviki instead, but then campaigned on nothing. Right? He didn't have a positive message or anything and still doesn't really. Um, and I think the, the lesson for smart dictators is that you need that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, making mistakes out of touch, um, too long in the tooth, relying on a model that worked in the past but isn't working now. Yeah, I think we can see all of that. Okay, thank you. Um, and we had a question from Lizaveta Bichko. Would you like to unmute yourself? Or oh, I'm happy to read it. Okay, I will just read it from the um, from the chat. As an international Asia student from Belarus, I'd like to ask the following question: Do the actions and reactions of the West influence the actions of Lukashenko, or has he totally rejected the possibility of developing a dialogue with the West? So, this is the other side of the coin from the questions, I guess, of the influence of Russia in the present day. Well, um, two things. First, um, the reaction of the West has been pretty minimal, even by minimal Western standards. Um, I think some Ukrainian satirists a couple of years ago set up this EU concernometer, right? <laughs> from EU declarations about being concerned or very concerned or seriously concerned, <laughs> um, sort of mocking that. Um, and same here. I mean, belatedly, we have some sanctions. UK went on its own. Um, three Baltic states went on their own in the opposite direction. They went early before general EU agreement. Um, despite economic threats to them from Belarus. Um, America, totally absent. Um, not, not, a, not, a, not an engaged player in any of this at all. Um, the regime does have um, some money stashed abroad, um, but not as much as you know, the Russian regime, the Russian oligarchy does. Um, ironically, the private economy, the new IT, IT economy is in part reliant on this, those kind of offshore links uh, for opposite reasons, to protect themselves from sh shakedown by the local regime. Um, so any kind of general economic sanction regime would have to skirt those difficulties, uh, but wouldn't be as, as effective because you can see that in, in 10, 20 years, if Lukashenko lost power, that Belarus isn't Armenia, it might actually change quite a lot. Um, that the new private economy might grow, trade would diversify, but Belarus isn't at that point yet. Um, it is essentially in the six Eastern Partnership countries where trade is still primarily with Russia. It's not that diversified. Um, so Western linkage and leverage has been minimal and positive action by the West has been minimal. Um, oh yeah, second part of the question. Belarus has been following not a balancing act in its foreign policy. It's not in the middle of some metaphorical plank between Russia and the West, it never has been, but it has been trying to diversify and hedge its primary relationship with Russia. And there are signs that that's going to be thrown out the window. Um, that the influential chair of one of the committees of parliament has basically said it's dead already. Um, 
as a kind of move. He thinks he can be a player in any new um, pro-Russian party. Um, so that's quite shocking, actually, that Lukashenko, for personal survival, is prepared to chuck out everything that's happened in the last five, ten years. Um, the diversification of the economy, changes in foreign policy, soft Belarusianization in, in cultural policy, that he would throw all of that away in order to stay in power. Um, that's what happens in highly personalized autocracies. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's a question from um, Jonathan Millens. If you'd like to ask it or, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, you mentioned about uh, Babarico previously, earlier. Um, and in that context, I was wondering whether you think it's more likely that Tikhonovskaya could be overtaken by, um, let's say, less radical elements in the opposition and more conservative elements, more pro-Russian elements um, around Babarico and maybe Babarico um, himself. Um, given that the opposition are basically unified on only one thing, which is just the removal of Lukashenko and that maybe Babariko and those around him are a more viable option to achieving that goal um, with presumably some support from Russia, whether that is a more uh, likely scenario. Thank you. Yes, um, although what actually happens in any transition scenario would also depend on how managed the transition was, um, what kind of steers were given, which seems highly likely uh, that it wouldn't be left to pure politics or cephalogy or um, anything like that. Um, I mean, Sikhanovsky, I think, has done very well for a genuinely accidental candidate. Um, and I'd say the feminization of the campaign is very important. Um, but she doesn't have any natural uh, political, well, she has no political experience. Um, she is a figurehead, as you say. Um, anti Lukashenko feeling is probably a lot stronger than positive pro Tsikhanovskaya feeling. And you did have a little bit of a paradox in this phone call with her husband. You know, Feminisation of the campaign is a genuine thing, but there she was following his daft orders and you know, ending up in a mess. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I, I am mindful of the time. So if that's okay with everyone, I will bunch the last few questions together and then Andy can, if you're happy to, can answer them sort of all together. Uh, to make sure that most questions are asked. So there's a follow question uh, from Gregory uh, Sandstrom, who asks, what role, if any, does the RADA, does the RADA have to play in the current situation? Uh, is President uh, Ivanka Sevilla of, the, of this world's longest government in exile anything more than a figurehead? Can the RADA in exile serve in, in any way as a legitimate provisional parliament? So that's one of the questions. Then there is a question from uh, Jacob Horter, who asks, what are the potential scenarios for regime collapse in Belarus as a result of the protests? Um, and a question from Robert Woolley, who asks, you mentioned the economic aspects of the protests. How important is, are those for other economic factors? And do you think the prospect of EU aid for legitimate government to have any effect? Uh, can you repeat the last two, please, again? So the last two is, what are the economic aspects of the protests and how important are they? Uh, are there any prospects of the EU's promise of aid for legitimate government going to have any impact? And what are the potential scenarios for regime collapse in Belarus? I'm just writing that down. Sure. Sorry. I, I... Um, first question. 
And actually, there's a follow up final final one um, that I'd like to tally on with, which is tallied with what you have just mentioned, which is um, from Sophie, Bur Sophie Bourne, who asks, do you think we might start to see greater female engagement in Belarusian politics? As a result of the successes of female campaigners in the election time cycle, I thought it was a good, a, a good final question to finish up on. Thank you. Uh, the first question, um, for those of you who don't know, the short-lived uh, Belarusian People's Republic of 1918 uh, bequeathed a government in exile, um, which has virtually zero influence on the current um, events, sadly. Um, I think that's just a complete no. Um, it wouldn't be perceived by all parties as a potentially neutral um, uh, substitute. Um, it doesn't have the authority for that. I can't even see it brokering negotiations. Um, but an interesting suggestion, I hadn't heard that before, um, strikes me as unlikely, very unlikely. Um, what are the possible possibilities of regime collapse? Um, well, at the moment, the regime looks strong, um, but its props of support are fewer than they were. It is narrowly, its power much more narrowly rests on coercion alone. Could the instruments of coercion fail? Uh, at the moment, we've only seen sort of low-level de desertion, uh, despite the deep anon campaign. Um, some symbolic effect event might affect that. Um, you know, deaths. You know, the, the government has threatened um, lethal violence, and it's sort of counter ultimatum. But if people were killed, that could cause a crisis. Um, you know, because despite Lukashenko's brandishing of a Kalashnikov and claiming to be opposite of Yanukovych, you haven't had yet the denouement, the kind of level of violence that was seen in Ukraine in the last um, two weeks or escalating over the last month. Um, despite severe, initially much more severe and savage general repression, you haven't seen um, as much violence on the streets, though you've seen rubber bullets, water cannons, that kind of thing. Um, so I'd say the possibility of regime collapse via the instruments of coercion failing uh, is a possibility, but not yet a likely possibility. More likely, economic collapse, a real economic crisis. I mean, you have both long-term problems behind the protests and behind the weakness of the regime and an inability to buy protesters off and huge short-term problems as well with uh, about a quarter uh, fall in both the currency and the national reserves, which are tiny anyway. Um, so the government really has zero money in the kitty almost. Um, so short-term economic prices might change a lot of people's minds. Um, and we're all facing that over this winter. Um, the, in what respects were economic factors driving the current protests, if I got that right? Um, I think, I mean, I've talked about that a little already, but there has been some research, uh, basically uh, semi-structured interviews of protesters on the streets um, with the researcher in question saying uh, that this was the new middle class on Marsh um, and that she could detect relatively little uh, working class support um, 
but the model from the beginning was actually the old 1970s Polish model of a inter intelligentsia in alliance with a separate workers' movement. Um, and partly that was nipped in the bud by regime coercion, like I said. Um, but yeah, um, as I say, shot by both sides that the old economy uh, and the social contract that kept the account, old economy going uh, is in decay. Um, but the new economy resents the kind of limits placed on it by the neo-Soviet economic model and the taxes that are raised to pay for support for the old economy. So problems for Lukashenko on both sides. Um, the positive EU package, I think, is a good idea. Um, excellent idea. Um, but um, uh, who was it? I think it was Lithuania, Poland and Romania did come up with the kind of uh, carrot to go alongside the pretty small stick of limited sanctions, um, which was trade facilitation, visa facilitation and hard cash uh, uh, and more open markets uh, and assistance with Rush, Belarus's dialogue with IFIs, international, you know, IMF, etc. Um, that's quite a, a good offer. And I think it, working with the grain, um, Belarus is not Armenia. Um, and uh, a post Lukashenko Belarus could de develop its economic ties with the EU quite rapidly, um, partly because of catch up and partly because of geography and partly because it's other diversification strategy that we, I didn't have had time to talk about with China means that uh, Belarus wants to be the penultimate stop on the one belt, one row to Europe. So again, that would imply more linkage with Europe. Um, so thumbs up for that on the whole. Um, greater female engagement, yeah. Um, that's been such a prominent feature and such a successful feature. Uh, first of all, of the campaigns and the, th the messaging, positive messaging in the campaign um, and the nature of the protests. Um, uh, not just female, but multi-generational. Um, this kind of grandmothers against the Oman thing was interesting. And there's this famous grandmother who's kind of symbol of the protests in a very kind of matriarchal, patriarchal way. Yeah, the police can't beat up this 80 year old woman because that would look terrible. Um, so various types of female engagement. Um, and I think the women will be very prominent in a centrist party close to hopefully all three of the main candidates, although it may be the case that they argue and divide, um, but hopefully a kind of joint party of the Sikhanovskaya Sapkal and Babarika campaigns would have very, very prominent women that you mentioned in it, um, in a country where the majority of people are women. 54. 46, if I remember well. Mm, I think so. That. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew, for the talk, but also for holding the fort for so long and trying to answer so many questions as a follow up. Thank you for everyone for both coming, but also staying till the end. It's great to have had such a an active and engaged audience and participation. But uh, mostly I would like to thank Andrew for giving an incredibly broad uh, and deep presentation about the current sort of academic implications of events in Belarus. Thank you so much. And I would like to alert everyone to Andrew's book on Belarus, the updated book that should be coming out in spring, if that's correct. Yeah. So look out for that. Uh, Belarus, the last European dictatorship. So thank you everyone for coming. And I would also like to briefly alert you to our next event on the 19th 
of November between 1 and 2 p.m., which is going to be um, done by Dr. Marcin Kazmowski from University of Glasgow, and that will be on Russia-China relations, and he will present a paper entitled Beyond Power and Status, Explaining Russia's Accommodation to China's Rise. So it'd be great to see as many of you at that event as possible. Um, and once again, thank you everyone for coming and thank you for Andrew for presenting.